Thanks, um, James, for uh, inviting me to uh, give a presentation about Egg Beach. Um, it's always nice to be here. This is the third time I've been here in, in Boulder, and it's it's always snowing. I noticed, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe the summers are different. Um, so Egg Beach is uh, is a uh, open source model that was developed for the, the Army Corps, and uh, it was. Uh, specifically developed to provide morphodynamic modeling capability to look at uh, impacts of hurricanes on coasts. Um, there's a long history behind it, but it, it, uh, it was initially developed by a, a small, relatively small group of people, um, and the PI was uh, Dano Rubin. Um, he's at uh, UNESCO, and then involved people at uh, Delta Iris, uh, Delft University, and then when I moved to Miami, it also involved uh, the University of Miami. And what you see at the top is uh, an example of the new uh, X Beach website, um, because the old one was falling apart. So they developed a new one, and this is where you can get all the information that I'm not showing you. It has uh, YouTube videos, etc. cetera. So, uh, the other thing is, uh, as it, from its inception, it has uh, gone from a relatively a uh, small group to a lot of people that are developing and that are using this model. So um, I'm happy to be, to be part of that. I adopted the title for, uh, from uh, essentially from James. He told me to talk about spatial scales and uh, temporal scales. So I thought that was a good start for the title. And instead of going to larger scales, I keep going back to smaller scales. So um, we'll see where we end up. Uh, we have a lot of support, ongoing support, and there's also European support, which I haven't mentioned. Okay, so it has almost no equations in it, which is, uh, which is good, but I have to talk about the, the processes. So the key process th that we included in this modeling was uh, wave groups. So to simulate erosion under uh, uh, storm conditions, instead of just using a mean wave height, we added a shorter scale process um, on the time scale of wave groups. And wave groups have time scales of about 25 seconds. So what you see here is uh, a depiction of wave groups that are um, incident on the beach. These wave groups, uh, because of their modulation in energy and momentum, they generate infragravity waves. And the infragravity waves is ultimately what runs up and down the beach, causing a lot of uh, uh, sediment motion. So. For us, that turned out to be a really important part of the process. The other part is uh, avalanching. So as these waves run up the, the dune face, it mobilizes the sand. And if the, sand, if the slope gets too steep, it avalanches. And the sand gets deposited from the dune into the foreshore and where it gets transported by waves and currents. So avalanching is important. Wave groups are important. Um, to test the model, we uh, compared it to uh, a number of observations. And uh, this is an experiment uh, that was performed in the uh, Delta Flume in, uh, in the Netherlands. It's a prototype flume, pretty large scale, not true prototype, but pretty large scale. And uh, we compared the measurements with observations. What you see here is uh, the initial profile is in black, and then you see two blue lines. And the dashed line is uh, the X Beach model computation. And the solid blue line is the, uh, the observation. And this is after one hour, two hours, four hours, and eight hours. And essentially, the model is very good at predicting dune erosion. It doesn't do such, uh, such a good job at the bar that's developing in reality. The model is not capable of doing that. The other thing I want to point out is that uh, if you exclude avalanching, it does a, I was going to say, crappy job. Okay? It, doesn't, it doesn't do a good job um, in predicting dune erosion if you do not include avalanching. If you leave out the wave groups, it's equally bad. So apparently, these two mechanisms are important. That also meant that we needed to include smaller spatial and time scales to get something that is occurring at a larger time scale. 
Another example is uh, breaching. So this is uh, based on an experiment that was done by Paul Visser, uh, where they went into the field, they built a dike of about 250 meters long, and they had an initial, um, what do you call that, um, cut into it, not very big, but at least that it started the flow. And then uh, in, within, a, within one hour, we go from a relatively narrow channel to a deeper channel, and then as time progresses, so time is on the horizontal axis in minutes, as time progresses, we see that the channel is um, starting to widen, and after one hour, we see that more or less the channel evolution has come to a stop because the water level inside and outside are similar. On the right, you see a few pictures of, uh, not of this specific event, but this is what we observed in the summer. We did a field experiment in Carmel, and uh, yeah, at Carmel's River State Beach, and this is a femoral river, and supposedly during the summers that river is closed, except for this year it was really wet, it rained a lot, so while we were doing an experiment which was not focused on femoral rivers, um, we had a lot of water coming in from this river, it would breach, and then it would close up again, it would breach again, and uh, so I think we have a really nice data set that, uh, that we're going to explore with Eggs Beach. This is a really cool result that was obtained by uh, Robert McCall. Um, he looked at uh, modeling of overwash at uh, Santa Rosa Island during uh, Hurricane Ivan. And what you see is uh, um, model predictions of uh, the barrier island at the beginning of the hurricane. So this is where a lot of the waves are reflecting. This is a snapshot of the surface elevation. Um, and then during the storm, the overwash is being initiated. So you see water coming from the, um, the Gulf of Mexico side into the Back Barrier Bay. Here we have full inundation, and here we have uh, the situation where the water level has dropped again after the hurricane has passed. This is data from uh, the USGS where we have the initial bed profile. You can see the road over here. So this is the Gulf of Mexico side. This is the Back Barrier Bay. The brown colors are high, relatively high. There's nothing high in, in Florida, I've noticed. Um, so relatively high. Um, this is the model simulation of the erosion after six hours where we see some initial dune erosion. This is where the overwash starts kicking in. And this is at the end where you can see that uh, the front of the island has lost a lot of sand and there's deposition on the island and in the back barrier bay. It's typical of uh, an overwash event. At the bottom are the observations. And as you can see, the patterns and the distribution are actually quite close. And he shows that for this specific case, we get a good uh, model skill. And uh, this is another example where you see the pre-storm parking lot and the post-storm parking lot. So apparently this model has some skill in predicting, let's say, uh, destructive uh, events. But that's the thing. It does it. It's, so it's very good at predicting what happens at, sh at short time scales with really high energy. Um, but we need, would like to have the capability of also looking at what happens on longer time scales, which means we have to say something about beach recovery. So we have two problems. One is we need to go for longer simulations, and the other thing is we have to go for beach recovery. Um, in the corner, I didn't mention it, but so I give the typical dimensions of the problem that we're calculating, uh, space, time scales, time, uh, time steps, duration, um, and you have to take into account that this is all based on my very old laptop. So you can do a lot faster if you have a better laptop. So this, this is uh, some examples that uh, Dana Ruving uh, calculated for the formation of an ebb tidal and flood tidal delta um, in a situation that's sort of typical for the Dutch uh, uh, coast. And uh, the key here is to get to longer time scales, we use a morphological factor. And there's actually a, a lot of other things you can do to speed up the process. 
Um, and it gives you really interesting results. So in this case, we have a tide that's just um, coming in and going out without any waves. So you see a nice uh, flood in F delta. And if you compare that to uh, the scenario where you have waves, uh, you see that there's a lot of, so the waves are actually from the, let's say, the north east, no, the north west. Um, so they're driving, the literal drift is directed from uh, west to east, and you see this bypassing of the sand. And so it is, the model approach like this is capable of uh, predicting long-term evolution, but the problem is that it does not add any functionality. So if the beach recovery phase, for example, is not included in this model approach, so that's a bit of a problem. And this is the big problem that we have. So we have all these short-term processes that are responsible for moving the sediment around related to waves and currents. And, and Pat just uh, gave another presentation about this. And of course, all of that is a function of the overall configuration, which is determined by stratigraphy, vegetation, whether as urbanization, you know, you can go on and on and on. And all of that feeds back into the sediment transport and then into the evolution of barrier islands, tidal delta formations, and et cetera. So the, the key question is, how do we resolve this? And uh, I want to have, I, so I started looking at, well, what, what happens if we take the barrier island recovery as a case? So we know that X Beach does a good job in getting rid of all the sand. Now we'd like to get it back. That's, that's the key. So um, initial profile, and then we have the black dash line which I call the post-storm profile. And then we need to have some mechanism that actually brings the sand from offshore to the coast so it can build up, the wind can pick it up, and we can get a new barrier island. So we need onshore sediment transport to restore this barrier island. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Now, if we use X Beach for this, because it's so good at predicting erosion, it'll erode the beach. Um, and that's related to the fact that we have uh, a wave-related mass flux that's bringing mass onshore in the surf zone, um, creating a return current or undertow to bring it back. And as a result, we typically find erosion at the shoreline and some deposition um, further offshore. Okay, better hurry up. So that's a problem. So in, to solve this problem, we go back uh, to even smaller scales. So instead of wave groups, we're now going to look at individual waves. So these are X-Beach simulations that were done by Arnold Verroje, where you see the run-up of individual waves on the beach. And the hypothesis is now that the turbulence, which is at the front of this bore that is running up the beach, is picking up all this sediment, and it's moving it onto the beach and leaving it as uh, the wave goes back. So to solve this long-term problem, we're now going back to the intra-wave time scale, which seems counterintuitive, to say the least. OK, so we have some neat experiments that we've done uh, about two years ago, could be three, um, in uh, Monterey Bay. And what you see here on the upper left are two surveys of uh, the, uh, the bathymetry. And Monterey Bay is characterized by a beach that has persistent rip channels and shoals. So this is a rip channel over here. This is a shoal. There's another shoal here. And this is a 10-day difference. So you can see there are differences in the, in the bathymetry. Um, this, these are the conditions during that 10-day time period. So this is the tide, tidal elevation over here. We have the significant wave height offshore, which is the green line. And then we have the measured uh, wave height um, at uh, pressure sensor one, which is modulated by the tide. Um, we have the mean period, which is about 10 seconds, relatively constant. And this is a fruit number that says something about the strength of the circulation of the rip currents. So in the beginning, it's relatively weak. And then it sort of picks up, and it peaks at low tides. And this bottom plot is um, the grain size, the mean grain size as function of time and space. And this is obtained by uh, using Edie Gallagher's uh, digital image uh, processing gear, this. 
um, which shows you the grain size distribution or the mean grain size in millimeters. So it ranges from about 100 micron to 1.5 millimeters. And what you see is, so this is time and this is space, that there's a spot of coarse sediment which is located around 45 meters, which is sort of where the, the, breaks, the waves are breaking. So this is where the, sh the foreshore connects to the beach and you have a, st a strong change in the slope and this is the shore break. So there's a vigorous breaking at the shore break and we observe just by looking at it that at that location you see a lot of sediment being entrained into these breaking waves that then travel off the beach. So that was the main motivation to start looking at this. Now if you look at the individ individual profiles, so this is, I have two transects, one S and one N. Um, if you look at the individual profiles over 10 days, there's significant variation. But if you look at the alongshore varied average profiles, you can see that over the 10 day period, even though there's a lot of variation in wave height and tidal elevation, it's more or less the same. There's some small changes. So it suggests that the beach profile is um, stable. So the question is for us now, can we model this? Because we know that X beach always erodes everything. Can we, by taking into account these additional processes, can we actually model the stability of this profile? And of course the answer is yes, because otherwise I wouldn't be, keep, I wouldn't be telling you this story. Uh, so, but to do so, we used a multi-sediment class formulation into X beach. Um, so I've defined 10 layers and 10 different sediment grain sizes. It's all sand. We can calculate the sediment transport associated with each of these sediment classes. And then for each sediment class, we can calculate what the corresponding changes in the bed elevation. So that way we can calculate the change in the bed profile and we can also calculate the change in the, in the grain size distribution. What you see here are the results. So on the left is the measured profile, uh, the blue and the cyan. And the difference between the two correspond to this dashed black line over here. So and that's after 10 days. So this dashed black line doesn't change in time. It's just the final profile change. Then what you see is the model calculations, um, which is uh, the grain size distribution in color. So the initial grain size distribution is a combination of all these different grain sizes that we put together. Um, but then you see that um, there's um, some erosion at the shore break. So if you remember where we are, it's sort of where the waves are breaking. So we see a buildup of coarse sediment at the location where the breaking is most vigorous. We see uh, finer sediment being uh, transported offshore and finer sediment being transported onshore. So we see a nice sorting of sediment, which occurs at relatively short time scales. Um, the bottom plot shows the comparison between predicted and model grain size distributions at the surface. So this is compared to Edie's uh, uh, camera observations. And provided that the rip currents are not very strong, it seems to be doing a pretty good job. The other thing is that the changes in the profile, so this is after 10 days, both in the model and in the observations are relatively small. So by including this process, we can um, stabilize the profile. However, um, so now you know, we wanted to look at recovery, and now we're looking at intra-wave processes. So the time steps that we're looking at are less than a second, the uh, vertical distribution is in the order of centimeters. Uh, so we have added a dimension. You know, we have a horizontal dimension, but now we also have a vertical dimension. So we made the problem just a lot worse to get to where we want to go. Um, so that seems like a very long way to go before we can get any, any good results. Um, so the key is to aggregate these small scale results to a scale where we can use it to predict longer term changes. And my argument is that that is, and of course that's what everybody is doing uh, in trying to decide what kind of model they want to use and what kind of physics they want to use. The key is to get the processes that are relevant for the long-term evolution. 
what we can do at the small scales is that we can give you ideas of, about what is important and hopefully that we can translate that into something that operates on longer time scales and we can have more physics in the longer time scale model. So um, we need to couple these systems uh, to enhance the functionality. And this is uh, another example. So this is something what, what people at Deltaires are working on. So the beach recovery phase, so this is uh, another example of what uh, the erosion and uh, deposition um, during a hurricane. So all the red dots are actually houses that have disappeared. Uh, so to, recover, to be able to predict the recovery, you need to have onshore sediment transport. I said that already. Berm building, because once you have sand on the berm, the wind can pick it up and can move it along. So wind is important. Then, of course, we get all these other things that are important like vegetation, um, buildings, etc. But at this point, we're looking at this part of the problem and not so much at what happens at the next level. And to do that, um, this is where systems comes in. This is where we can couple all these different sub-processes at uh, their level at which they're optimal, which they can work well for you to get something that works on a much longer time scale. So there's a, an experiment go, ongoing at uh, Del Tires where they're coupling June, which is an Aeolian sediment transport model, with X Beach for the times when the beach is eroding during storm conditions, and then Del 3D for the more moderate conditions. Um, the first test case is uh, Assateague Island in collaboration with the US, yes. And of course, uh, this is not done by myself. This is a large group of people, and I'm sure I forgot a lot about it. other people that are involved. But thank you. Thanks, Ab. The perfect timing. Thank you. And are there any questions? We have time for some questions. going to seem like a crazy question, but um, in the tropical environments, are there things like, I don't know, cementation, uh, iron, things like that that are going on that are, that happen in these tropical environments that may not happen in the more northern U.S., European environments? Is, is X Beach, uh, been tested like in, I don't know, Indonesia and places like that? Uh, the short answer is no. It's not been tested in, in those kind of environments. Uh, it's been thoroughly tested in uh, European environments. Um, of course, we've used it in subtropical environments. Um, but um, yeah, anything that would affect the behavior of yeah, sediment, of course, that would the result. Okay. All right. Look forward to discussions about the most effective way to incorporate what you learn with the smaller time scale and spatial scale modeling into longer term. But I wanted to ask you a separate question about a detail. It seems to me that the onshore transport that has been missing from X Beach is mostly velocity asymmetry that could bring sand from deeper. You were talking about moving sand onshore in the swash zone, but you need to also bring sand from the lower shore face to, to get recovery after a storm. And could you get get that in there? I, last yes. time I knew, I don't think so, there was. Um, actually, the, the sediment transport modeling that we included in this example has bed load and suspended load. The bed load has um, the velocity asymmetry in it. So I'm um, using Nielsen expression to look at the differences in the shear stress on the progressive waves. Um, but in addition, so we found that if you don't have the suspended part, which is related to the bore uh, suspension, um, you don't get the result that we observed. So it, it needed an additional process to get, to get it right. I had, a, I had a, a question rather similar to James's, and uh, can you extend this? You, you mentioned that this was good, or you used uh, sand grain sizes. Can you uh, extend this into gravel beaches? 
Um, you can, and there's a group in the, in the UK that is working on it. Um, the thing with gravel beaches is that the groundwater flow becomes very important. So um, there's, an, yeah, there's additional mechanisms that are to be taken into account. But x beach can cope with groundwater, so, and it seems to work well. Any other questions? No? Well, thanks, Ed. Thank you.